physical exam and imaging of the shoulder instability. My name is Mary Lloyd Ireland. I'm an orthopedic surgeon practicing at the University of Kentucky. I do have a website, which is MaryLloydIreland.com, and I would welcome your visiting that website. It has my publications and some other narrated PowerPoints you might enjoy. At the University of Kentucky, we also have a YouTube channel. As with any musculoskeletal injury, it is very important to make the primary diagnosis. The shoulder can be a difficult joint because we have several joints, the acromiocavicular joint and the glenohumeral joint, and other bursal articulations, the subacromial space, the scapulothoracic articulation. But if you know the anatomy, know the biomechanics of the sport, know how to do a good exam and can interpret the x-rays, initially plain x-rays, then you can make the primary diagnosis, typically with history, physical exam, and plain x-rays. The physical exam is done in four positions, standing, sitting, supine, and prone. It is also important to check cervical and thoracic spine as there can be referred pain from the neck, such as a radiculopathy or other problems that are proximal. Check the scapula for symmetry. Typically, if there is scapulothoracic dysfunction, as a result of the glenohumeral abnormality, the scapula will have trigger points superior medially, and typically the scapula goes into a protracted elevated position. It's also important to check the vascular status to make sure there are no problems such as thoracic outlet syndrome or cervical Is it referred pain? Is it coming from the neck, the scapula, the lungs, or the ribs? What tests do I do? I like to describe what I'm doing in the test rather than the name of the person who described the test. In this way, I'm thinking anatomically what the injured structure is and trying to reproduce the patient's pain. There are a lot of name tests, but I will describe what I do in my dictation and EMR. Do the most painful part of the examination last. There are many clinical tests named for someone. Instead of the name, think of the motion that you are applying and the forces that you apply. Is the problem labral? In that situation, you're thinking about doing axial loading and rotation, much like a McMurray's test of the knee. Also think about the age group and the sport. A labral tear is much more common, such as a slap tear in an overhead athlete, such as a baseball pitcher. Typically, labral tears that we can fix are less than age 30 years. Is it coming from the rotator cuff? In a young thrower, the rotator cuff can be injured in a distraction way. In the older individual, greater than age 50, typically the rotator cuff gets compressed or is impinged in the subacromial space. And there can be injury of tendonitis, tendinopathy, partial tear from the subacromial space, or more commonly from the articular side. Is it instability? Distraction of the joint capsule is done by subluxing the humeral head. Describe the direction. If there's apprehension, is the direction of the instability posterior, anterior, inferior, or all of the above as in a multi directional instability. Glenohumeral exam. Ask the patient, does this movement cause apprehension or pain? 
Laxity is a normal condition and is symmetrical. Instability is a pathologic condition and is asymmetrical. Ask the patient if they can reproduce their own symptoms. Can they make their shoulder come out of place as in a voluntary posterior instability in some of our young female athletes? Seated exam, make sure you have the shoulder and scapula exposed. Have females in a gown or a sports bra. The males should take their t-shirts off. Look at the scapulothoracic articulation. Have the patient do a seated jumping jack or a seated dip or have them get up and do a push up against the wall or palm press to see if the scapula moves symmetrically on the thoracic cage. Have the patient at the end of the table so you can go around the bed to examine the glenohumeral articulation and compare the injured to the normal by rocking them anteriorly, posteriorly, and inferiorly, you can get a feel for if it is symmetrical or asymmetrical, and also is there apprehension in one direction. Look for active range of motion. Is there pain greater than 90 degrees abduction? Then we think about a compressive problem with the rotator cuff, supraspinatus, infraspinatus. If you do a maximal internal or external rotation against forced resistance and they have pain along the proximal biceps, think of a slap tear, superior labrum, anterior, posterior, as is most common in a thrower. Then I go to the supine exam, reproducing this, looking for instability, looking for any compression, tests going across the chest, internal rotation that would be rotator cuff, and lastly, I have the patient roll over, and this is a good way where you can stabilize the scapula and go into external rotation, backward flexion for an anterior apprehension. You can also stabilize the scapula and push up to reproduce any posterior labral tear signs or instability. Repeat the equivocal parts of the exam. Determine the primary problem. Make the primary diagnosis. When you have examined the patient, looked at the x-rays, and you do a, another test, such as an MRI scan, you should write down what you feel the primary diagnosis is. Communicate with the radiologist. That diagnosis may change, but make the diagnosis. Don't just put shoulder pain. Is it capsule ligaments, as in instability? Is it labrum? Is it rotator cuff? There may certainly be secondary diagnoses, but based on the patient's sport, age, make the primary diagnosis. Now we'll talk about imaging. Plain films are very important. The American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons describes the initial imaging that should be obtained, a true AP and zero degree external rotation, lateral view in the scapular plane, and an axillary view. These plane x-rays should be done prior to any MR imaging. It's incredible how often MRI scans are done without plain images. So you need to see the whole forest and then look at the trees. Imaging initially are ordering these plain films. I also like to get a view called a striker view, which is an AP view with the arm externally rotated. The diagnosis can be made by history, physical, and plain films, and then treatment can be instituted. Re-examine the shoulder, see what the progress is, see if the pain is in the same location or has it changed. 
then special imaging studies should be done. If you can't read an MRI scan and you don't know what the quality of the scan will be, don't order it. Have a specialist who is well trained in shoulder examination, treatment, and management see them. That is a much better test than an MRI scan at a bad facility. These plane views, an AP view in internal rotation, this is the position of the patient and the upper right shows what the x-ray looks like. This is the striker notch view. This again is the position of the patient on the bottom. This is a very good view to look at the glenoid. You can see thrower's exostosis in this area back here in the back inferiorly. You can also visualize the acromioclavicular joint very nicely, and you can also visualize the proximal humeral epiphyseal plate, which in this patient is closed. An outlet view can be done either lying down or standing. This is what this view looks like. It is important to know if this is a gravity standing view or is the patient pushing up on their forearm. If a patient has a complete rotator cuff tear, the deltoid takes over and the humeral head will be elevated. It will the space will be less because of the unopposed deltoid making the humeral head go north without the rotator cuff which is torn chronically. So if there's an articulation here to here, then you could have a massive long-standing rotator cuff tear but oftentimes the patient is holding onto their arm and it may not actually be a gravity lateral view. So this is the view, a outlet view shown here. Also good for any scapular abnormalities such as a fracture or any tumor such as an osteochondroma. You can see here where these ribs are shown very well as, as well and if you're worried about a rib fracture, put a marker on plain x-ray on where the patient is most painful and then get a cone view. The axillary lateral view is a very important view. This is done as noted above. You can also do this view in internal rotation of the arm as above and also external rotation of the arm and sometimes this can delineate a abnormality of the posterior lateral humeral head or a hill sax deformity indi indicating anterior instability. This is the main view to see if the shoulder is located, the very shallow glenoid and very large humeral head here. So you can see here a Bankart lesion. This is a normal view but this is where the Bankart lesion would be this lip of the golf tee if you will on the very large golf ball, an inherently unstable joint. Special studies include an MRI scan. This can be done with or without intraarticular gadolinium. We rarely do IV gadolinium in young healthy people unless there is a bony or calcific abnormality within the bone itself seen on the plain x-rays. Intraarticular gadolinium is done in throwers if there is a suspicion of a slap tear. However, doing views in abduction external rotation or ABER views without intraarticular gadolinium sometimes will show a slap tear when the labrum peels back. So gadolinium may not be necessary and it is important to talk to the radiologist about what your thought is and if you need to order intraarticular dye, this must be scheduled before and talk to the athlete about the fact they're going to have a needle in their shoulder. CT scans are done more for fractures or a bony abnormality problem. We can also size the hill sax lesion of how big it is and this helps in planning of more major revision surgery 
of bony defects in chronic instability situations. For fracture, CT scan is nice. Ultrasound is done for determining where we're injecting. Ultrasound guided injections make sure that we're in the bicipital sheath groove for a biceps tendon problem or intraarticular for an adhesive capsulitis problem. Ultrasound can also be very beneficial to look at the rotator cuff to determine if there is a tear or a partial tear diagnostically. It's not really good for the labrum. It is nice to appreciate the anatomy and use ultrasound, which is a less expensive test. More primary care sports medicine physicians are trained in ultrasound guided injections, and this is very beneficial in diagnosis and treatment, making sure you're getting the needle where you want it. Ultrasound can be done in the office. It's accurate. It's of low cost. We'll see more and more articles written about ultrasonography. Best for determining rotator cuff tendonitis versus tear. Dr. Matson at the University of Washington has been using this for quite some time. He's an orthopedist. A lot of orthopedists in Europe use the ultrasound in management of shoulder injuries, particularly rotator cuff injuries. This ultrasound shows symptomatic progression of a previous asymptomatic rotator cuff tear over six years that is now a complete rotator cuff tear as shown by the arrows. What about ultrasound? This is a series of 50 patients who underwent arthroscopy examined with 3D ultrasound and MR arthrography. The arthroscopic diagnosis was full thickness in 40, partial 5, intact 5. 3D ultrasound correctly diagnosed 35 out of 40 full thickness ultrasound and MR arthrography 39 out of 40. Partial tears, the ultrasound was 2 and the MR was 1. So in conclusion, in this study that was done seven years ago, 3D ultrasound was promising as an imaging study compared to MR arthrography for assessment of supraspinatus tendon tears. Much less expensive. Talk to your musculoskeletal radiologist about which test is best. Certainly the ultrasound is less expensive. When should an MRI scan be obtained? Recent trauma, difficult physical exam, the physical exam that doesn't match the clinical symptoms, normal radiographs with significant symptoms, in preoperative planning, and unfortunately all too often we see a recent MRI scan that was technically suboptimal. The treatment of this patient can be to make the diagnosis, do rehab, but sometime we do have to repeat the MR either at the facility it was done initially with more instructions on what we're looking for and getting a better scan or getting it approved for a scan in a better scanner. How should the MRI scan be performed? With the best equipment possible dedicated coils for the body part, contrast when necessary, correct sequences to define appropriate anatomy, and the shortest exam to achieve the results and keep the patient comfortable. It's very uncomfortable if it is a lengthy exam, the patient is big and is in a gantry that is small, they're moving, so we do want a short time exam, but we also want a good study to give us more information to make the proper diagnosis. 
Contrast admitted Administration, intraarticular contrast gives superior soft tissue contrast and significantly enhances diagnostic capability. IV contrast is useful for post-op menisci problems or tumors, or if you do see something on the plain radiographs that you're concerned about, IV contrast should be considered. Again, talk to the radiologist about this before the study is done so that one study can be done if you need intra-articular dye for a slap tear, do that. If you're worried about some bony lesion, you may need IV gadolinium. When to use intra-articular contrast? I like to use it in a slap lesion. It may improve the diagnosis. Slap tears may be missed in about 25% of the time. It isn't necessary to use intraarticular contrast in an acute dislocation as there would be a hemarthrosis and this would serve as the intraarticular dye. With the arm in an abducted externally rotated position, this is what the axial view looks like. You can see the normal subscap out in the front the normal position of the biceps right here. This is an intraarticular gadolinium. And you can see how in maximal external rotation, the humeral head comes forward and there is a labral tear. So in an aber position or an externally rotated position, the humeral head comes forward and then shows the instability of the labrum on the glenoid. So these views can be helpful sometime without intraarticular gadolinium, an abducted external rotated view. This is with the arm in internal rotation, and you can see here where now the humeral head is more central or more seated in the glenoid. The biceps has changed shape a little bit, and there is a uh, unstable slap tear out here, but you ha don't have it loaded now. So this is a view in internal rotation. So varying the position of the arm can be helpful in making diagnosis of instability or a slap tear. The Aber view, the advantages, you can do this without intraarticular gadolinium, and this is the way it should be done at first. You must have a method so the patient will be comfortable and not move. Sometimes this can be done with a sandbag. Recent studies have shown that the Aber view in patients with unstable slap tears had posterior humeral head translation in the Aber compared to neutral abduction of greater than th 3 millimeters. So look for the humeral head position or position of the labrum and the glenoid posterior superior. So you can do this Aber view, and if it is positive, for a labrum tear, then you don't need to do the intraarticular gadolinium view. This is what the Aber view looks like. Again, you can see the position of the humerus, and then what you're looking for is a peel back. This doesn't show this in this individual, but this is a uh, would be peeled back, and that would be a slap tear. This one did have intraarticular gadolinium. Talk with a radiologist about doing these Aber views in your thrower, overhead pitchers, and sometime in your instability. This is an intraarticular gadolinium view with humeral head here, a couple of cysts where the rotator cuff attaches, and you can clearly see here where there is a gap from the superior labrum to the glenoid right here, so this is a slap tear. slap tear in external rotation, which shows this very significantly removed from the glenoid. Unstable slap tear. The arrow is pointing to the glenoid where the labrum should be, but the labrum instead is out here. Very well demonstrated with various variations of rotation of the humeral head and the intraarticular gadolinium. This is a view of a knee which you would typically think about looking at the patella on this axial view. But if you look 
At the lateral meniscus, you can clearly see a lateral meniscus tear, which can be missed on other views, the coronal or the sagittal. So on this view, you can see a bird's eye view, if you will, of the lateral meniscus and this radial tear, as well as an abnormality of the posterior root. How is this go with the shoulder. Well, when we look at coronal views of the shoulder, sometimes you can get this on foss view, so to speak, of the labrum and see the labrum circumferentially as it deepens and attaches to the glenoid. So this is a T1 sagittal coronal view. And you can see here where you see this nice labrum all the way around. You don't get this view all the time, but when you do get it, it can be very helpful for instability. If there's an anterior inferior labral tear, this would mean an anterior instability. Perhaps a bony bank heart would be here. If you see something posteriorly, there could have been an acute posterior dislocation, a labral tear. And then the slap tear would be up here. So think about this as the different quadrants. Anterior instability with anterior inferior quadrant. Posterior instability, posterior inferior quadrant. Slap is in that superior uh, quadrant above the equator. So the sagittal view of the shoulder for the labrum is like the axial view for a radial tear of the lateral meniscus. This view is much like this view. It gives us a lot of information if we get that cut. We'll talk a little bit about the different lesions. The bank heart lesion these are shown with intraarticular gadolinium, and I'd like to thank Dr. Martin Schwartz, radiologist at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, for these images. This is where we get into alphabet soup a little bit with a different abbreviation. So the abbreviations are named for the structures that are injured. Bankhart described this many years ago as an avulsion of the labrum, capsule, and anterior inferior ligaments from the glenoid. So this is what it looks like schematically. This is what it looks like on the MRI scan. So in thinking about this as a big golf ball on a shallow tee, you've knocked off that anterior lip of the glenoid, both bony here as well as the labrum. So this is a bank heart lesion, stripping of the periosteum and the labrum is lifted off from its bony attachment on the glenoid anteriorly. A Perthes lesion involves more periosteal stripping well down over the neck of the glenoid. So the gadolinium goes further up on the neck of the glenoid. This is a Perthes lesion. The Alpsa lesion, again getting into alphabet soup, what that stands for is anterior labroligamentous periosteal sleeve avulsion lesion. So you can see here where the labrum kind of stays here. And then this is a periosteal sleeve avulsion lesion, as seen here. The GLAD lesion is a glenoid labrum articular disruption. So this is the articular surface right here of the glenoid. And then this divot right here, or pothole, this came off with the labrum tear, and there's a split in the labrum. So this is a GLAD lesion, glenoid labrum articular disruption. Need intraarticular gadolinium to make this call. The treatment for these basically is similar in that an anterior repair, reconstruction, usually acutely can be done arthroscopic, but you've got to put that back down to the glenoid with anchors or sutures. This is a lesion that isn't quite as common as on the glenoid side with instability, but it's called a Hagel lesion, humeral avulsion of the glenohumeral ligament. And this, you do need intraarticular gadolinium. And so this lesion is not off of the glenoid. You can see here where you, there's the normal triangle of the glenoid labrum here. But this lesion is on the humeral attachment 
of the capsule. Not the glenoid side. Another view of that. Hagel lesion. This is an arthroscopic example of a Hagel lesion. So the glenoid side looked normal. This was an acute dislocation one time. He had an unstable shoulder exam, anterior direction. And so this tissue should be up here on the humerus. So what's done is we put an anchor with sutures into the humeral head and then pass sutures and basically now reapproximate the capsular tissue back where it should be and stabilize the shoulder. You have to look for it. It's nice to know that it may be there before arthroscopy, so that's where intraarticular GAD or blood is helpful to make this diagnosis by MRI scan. This is the arth arthroscopic view. You can see the labrum on the left looks completely normal, and this is what this Hagel lesion looks like. So the capsule here looks normal, a bubble hang hanging behind the prison cells right there. We're rotating the humerus internally and externally. This is the subscap out here in the front. The needle's coming through to anteriorly establish the portal and internal and external rotation. So we advance this tissue back up to the humerus. The patient did well. So in the images correlating the MRI scan with intraarticular gadolinium and anatomic abnormalities, we're thinking about the glenoid and the humeral head. And this can be compared as a golf ball on a tee or a ball on a circus seal or an eyeball and a contact lens. So if there's any little rip in that contact lens, such as a slap tear, then there's going to be pain in extremes of range of motion. With instability, got to think anterior, posterior, and again, the lip of that T or the nose of the circuit seal is going to be moving around relative to the ball. So you have to address surgically where the capsule and the labrum and the ligaments are injured and try to put them back to the appropriate side which most commonly is the glenoid side. That's a good analogy to use with patients and making them understand what's done at the time of surgery or how you're addressing their rehabilitation which is actually to try to get the circus seal underneath the ball so work proximal to in the treatment. Subscapularis tears can occur in association with instability. This is an internal rotator of the shoulder and an often forgotten part of the rotator cuff. The external rotators being the sit muscles or supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. Subscapularis is an internal rotator and is located in the front of the shoulder. Differential diagnosis of anterior shoulder pain should include some involvement of the subscapularis, whether it's a tendinopathy, strain, partial tear, or tear. The mechanism of a subscap tear is usually an acute one event. On physical exam, there's increased external rotation of the arm, apprehension on adduction, weakness in internal rotation. There are positive liftoff tests. The belly press and bear hug indicate the upper subscapularis is involved. The behind the back or half Nelson indicates the lower subscapularis is involved. 
This individual fell down his steps. He has good external rotation, but you can see here with his arm at his, uh, at his side, he's really trying, but he can't resist me in internal rotation, nor in any other position. He hurts over the subscap insertion. His abduction is to 90, and on a supine exam, he still can't internally rotate. He has good external rotation. And he also had increased external rotation passively, but no internal rotation. He can't get his hand into his back pocket, and this was his chief complaint. He had pain, a shoulder injury, but he was unable to get his wallet out of his back pocket. These are the belly press maneuvers, which would be indicative of an upper subscap. His was complete. So I have them push in their belly and then resist. And again, good external rotation, but he's got nothing in an internal rotation. He underwent a repair. So what do the images in this case look like? The plane images were normal. The subscapularis footprint is like the state of Nevada. So you have it inserting on the lesser tuberosity. There's the upper half and the lower half. It's a pretty big insertion on the lesser tuberosity, 2.5 by 1.5 centimeters. Widest is superior. It's important that we look at that arthroscopically. And the MRI scan, if the subscap is completely torn, shows a medial location of the biceps. So if you see this axial view and you see the biceps out of the groove, it should be sitting here and the biceps is here, you must think there's a subscap tear until proven otherwise. And what is involved from the standpoint of other structures, this is the subscap tendon as it inserts in the lesser tuberosity. The transverse humeral ligament stabilizes the biceps in the groove. You can have an injury which is unusual to the transverse humeral ligament by itself and the biceps subluxes medially, but more commonly it's an injury to the transverse humeral ligament and the subscap that both are torn and then the biceps flips medially. This can very easily be seen on this view. Sometimes you can't see the subscap as well, but if there's a medial location of the biceps on the MRI scan or a read, think about a tear of the subscap involving the coracohumeral and transverse humeral ligaments as well as the subscap. This was originally described in 1948, modified from Hitchcock as far as the anatomy involved in this. Obviously, MRI scans didn't come along till the mid-1980s, so we didn't have the MR, but the mechanism of anatomically why that occurred with the ligaments that are injured and the subscap and then the biceps medial in location was an observation at the time of surgery and Hitchcock did a lot of biceps surgeries and was the first one to describe the keyhole procedure of a proximal biceps tenodesis. This concludes the initial imaging part of the shoulder. So in conclusion, don't order a test if you can't read it. If you can't read the MRI scan, a better test to do would be a consultation with somebody who knows shoulders. Communicate with a radiologist at your imaging center. A bad scan is worse than no scan. In Kentucky, we have many MRI scanners Shoulder scans are notoriously bad if ordered by someone who is unable to examine a shoulder. Sometimes the MRI report just doesn't help. This one is actually in Chinese, and this makes a little more sense to me sometimes than the x-ray readings of the shoulder by English-speaking radiologists. There are some things that don't translate into Chinese, Dr. Lachman, this was an MRI of a knee, doesn't have symbols, and CT, an MRI scan. So communicate with your radiologist, and hopefully he will communicate better in the report. All MRI scans of the shoulder have some abnormality. Oftentimes it's a chromial slope or something like that, but I've never seen a normal MRI scan reading of a shoulder. 
So if you want to find something wrong with somebody's shoulder, do an MRI scan, and then you have to talk them off the MR cliff. They oftentimes think they're going to have a significant problem if they don't have surgery. Listen, look, examine, then listen, look, examine again. This cartoon, I'll have to do some x-rays to be sure, but I'm guessing you dislocated your shoulder. Hehe. <laughs>